Welcome everybody to this amazing interview from the epic marathon live stream that took place in February on Deleuze's birthday. I guess that was January. I don't know. At this point, I've got all these videos that I'm posting after the fact. And this one is with Justin Murphy, who was one of the early academics to leave academia and go into the underground, do his own thing online. And so uh, we're very excited to have him on here. And if you're interested at all in accelerationism, Nick Land, or how there's a weird sort of bridge or pipeline even from all of that into Catholicism and religion, then I think you're going to like this episode. Enjoy. All right, you guys can turn your cameras off. Hey, what's going on, guys? So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> Welcome, man. How's it going? Good, good. Can't complain. Is this a video thing? I forgot. Yeah, we're live. It's a video thing. The people who turned their uh, cameras off are the, uh, well, they're just going to be there for Q&A, potentially. Uh, let me let me get the three speaker view on here. Oh, Boom. Live? I didn't realize that. Shit, you didn't realize that? Okay, yeah. Really? I don't mind. Oh, okay. Uh, Is live on well, live on YouTube or live what you doing yeah. like, in your community or what? Yeah, just YouTube, yeah. And so cool. this is a right. this is like this. Well, let me let me ground you out really quick, and then I'll introduce you to the folks who are here. So uh, basically, I do these epic marathon streams. I, I I need to get like some kind of a copy pasta going where I explain it to every speaker because sometimes I explain it, sometimes I forget to. Um, in your case, I must have dropped the ball. But basically, I've been up since four thirty this morning um, live streaming, and uh, so I've had on a whole series of guests throughout the day including people like Alenka Zupancic. And uh, because it's to lose his birthday, we had on Brent Adkins, the author of Introduction to Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. And then, you know, we had Todd McGowan on later. Uh, we had Ashley Frowley and Christine Louis de Soli. And so there's been a variety of like these political conversations, but also these uh, conversations kind of between, uh, or I, I mean, really Lacan or Deleuze or between the two of them. And so when we talked to McGowan, we talked, Mikey was here with me and we talked about uh, Brent Adkins and that whole conversation because he had said some things about Deleuze and, and, uh, and about Lacan and everything like that. He had said some stuff about Hegel because he used to be into Heidegger and Hegel, uh, people we're really interested in as well. And so um, anyway, all that's to say that that's kind well, of, you're, you're like this uh, icing on the 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 cake i guess you're you're like the quilting point here but that's really exciting because we've been having this conversation about zizek and land and deleuze and lacan for a while now and you're like you're like the guy when it comes to deleuze when it comes to land and and, and mikey especially has been really advocating to to have this conversation with you he's got he's got a lot of questions i've got questions so i guess what i'll tell the audience though before i turn it over to mikey and let him say some things is just that uh Justin Murphy is somebody who at some point left academia, started doing things his own way, and has his own community on the internet and has had conversations with all kinds of edgy characters on the internet, including Amy Therese and uh, Mencius Moldbug, aka Curtis Yarvin and uh, Nick Land. But also you have all kinds of interesting artistic people who might not be into politics whatsoever on. And one of the things that I've appreciated the most about your work is even just the stuff where you're just explaining how to do things. Just very basic, kind of like the professor office hours, like here, here's how you do this thing. And I've gotten a lot of value uh, out of that over the years. And so thank you. Um, and you also wrote Base Deleuze. Uh, is there anything else you'd want to say in terms of introduction? No, that's more than enough. Thank you for the kind words. I'm really glad okay. to hang out with you. Cool. Mikey, want to take it away? Justin, I just want to say it's good to meet you. I've uh, been watching your videos for a long time, and so it's cool to have a conversation. Um, I guess I don't know how much you, you have heard about what Dave and I are trying to make happen or whatever. Um, we really would love to see Zizek and Land have a discussion. And yes, for fun meme fodder you know we talk about it as a debate but awesome. we, we talked to Slavoj about it's not even a debate it's more of a discussion and for us the reason why we would want it to happen is 
without any doubt, right? These are the two most famous philosopher slash memes uh, in the world that, and this is something unique that these two have in common where something about them resonates with people beyond just theory or philosophy. Um, they, they turn into memes uh, in and of themselves. And so I, uh, I asked Slavoj when we interviewed him the first time if he was familiar with Nick's work. And he goes, no. I was like, but you've talked about accelerationism before, and I've heard you say a couple things. And he's like, yeah. So I gave him a basic rundown of Lance Flot, which is hard to do without turning it into a caricature because you just – human extinction, AI singularity, like, and the subtleties of how Nick got to his position, it's hard to convey them in a short summary. But – what I was trying to do with Slavoj is just give him some sort of basic orientation with where land is coming from as a Deluso Guitarian. And um, what I think is interesting, there's more overlap with Zizek and land than meets the eye. So on the one hand, both of them are anti-democracy for different reasons, but um, like Slavoj considers the big stain on his early masterpiece sublime object is that he has a pro-democracy position, which he quickly moved away from. And so there's the anti-democracy thing. They both are interested in the singularity. Obviously, Land has been interested in that much longer than Slavoj, but Slavoj wrote his book, Hegel and the Wired Brain. They both hate political correctness, right, and that aspect of the left. And so I actually think there's a lot of overlap for them to actually riff off of, and that's why we're trying to make it happen. Slavoj is totally up for it. Land who knows if he will be um he obviously is hard to predict um but i is guess he not, is, is he is he not answering emails or what well he responded Dave, he, he, did, he responded yeah. yeah so actually that was i had said earlier to the audience that we had some like details that we were going to release a little bit later and that's the news everybody <laughs> but first, first like we, yeah, no, we it, want to have a conversation with him just to just talk wanna, about yeah. his work you know, and to establish, I guess that's the thing. Look, online, Dave and I are known as two members of the Young Zizekians. And so it's easy to just go, oh, you guys are trolling land. And I, I said it earlier, like I have a fundamental respect for land, a fundamental respect for Deleuze and Guattari, even if I disagree on the nature of desire or metaphysics or the status of negativity or all that. Um, you know, accelerationism, you know, that whole tradition, all of it, everything with the CCRU, has fundamentally influenced me. And so Land is one of these guys who who has influenced me. And look, I mean, I, I'm not sure how I would want to classify myself politically. Would Land probably call me a leftist and a transcendental miserableist? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, he's so, you know, because he's like blacklisted in the world of philosophy um, and everybody just wants, oh, it's chaos, uh, you know, speed poetry. No, it's fucking not. And this is one of the things I really appreciate about uh, a, a series of videos you were doing. Your line by line analysis of meltdown. And I really, I, I hope you finish it because it's, it's, I will. So, I'm committed. It's I will. Stuff. I will for sure. Yeah. And so what I loved about what you were doing there is like, no, 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 this ain't Adderall infused poetry. This is concentrated theory. And, and like you say, you could devote a whole essay or a whole lecture just to one sentence in that text. And so I fundamentally agree with you. I think it's one of the most important philosophical writings of the nineties. Um, I might even go as far as to say of the whole fucking century. Um, I think meltdown was incredibly inspired. And so I think this whole thing, Oh, land misreads D and G because he doesn't think in terms of re-territorialization. Therefore he's right. like these little, you know, and I, I, okay. If Fisher wants to make that point. That's cool. I mean, I get that there's, you know, he doesn't talk about the new earth and all that kind of, it's not his, his thing, but, uh, I just, you can't get out of reckoning with land just by going, he doesn't factor in re-territorialization enough. So long story short, I'll shut up. I just want to say that, um, where we're coming from. Yes. Slavoj has had an immense influence on all of us and we love them, but it's not some, oh, we're just trolling land or land. No, like I taught a four week course on land at Theory Underground because I think it's it, there's no getting around how much influence he's had. And this whole thing, oh, well, I'm just not going to listen to him or pay him anything. Then you then that's bullshit. Um, you have to reckon with the philosophy. And 
like his fundamental thesis, I think everybody who's concerned about capitalism has to take serious that that fundamental thesis of capitalism is artificial intelligence. And if you get it, understanding how he arrived at that and where he's coming from, it changes how you view capitalism entirely. So the, the discussion between Land and Zizek is going to happen. Is that the news? Well, no guarantee. We haven't talked. Land hasn't agreed no, to it. Like I said, he, we're trying he, to just, no, go ahead. He and uh, Anna Greenspan are both uh, planning to talk with us like one on one or, in you know, whatever. Just like in because those are separate, but both of them are on vacation right now. And so both of them have basically said, yes, we will get to this. Uh, but the debate thing, I did tell him about it. He didn't respond to that part. He just said, <laughs> we'll we'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea. I love that you guys have made it this sort of thing that you're trying to push as a, almost like a, a movement uh, and a meme. I think that's really cool and funny. And yeah, I mean, I would love to see it happen. I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced it would be an amazing uh, debate or discussion just because they're so different and their speaking styles are so different. But even if it was even if it was a train wreck, it would be so funny to see. And like, you know, he's like talks fast and he's like all over the place and then landed speaks really slow and uh he has that kind of like british politeness but zizek has that kind of like brash um you know kind of energy it would be so weird and unpredictable to, uh, trying to imagine what it would sound like those two trying to have a dialogue so i, well, I love the idea dave and i have learned and slavo is cool with it i'm like no i will cut you the fuck off like we will interrupt you you just we know what you do and so if we if it did work out I'm going to go out of my way. Like Slavoj, you've talked for 15 minutes. Nick gets 15 minutes. Like this is going to be, you know, even in that. And, um, okay. you know, and, and, and that's yeah. the thing. Would it be disappointing? Yeah, probably in, in one sense. Right. I think because it would, it's not going to be combative. I think the second they actually just start talking about the singularity or they start talking about capitalism or democracy, it's actually going to get very calm and intellectual. Uh, okay, and then and then after that, when that's a huge success, then you have Nick Land in conversation with Jordan Peterson. <laughs> I, the I, just, uh, I, I I love to see Peterson deal with the lemurs. I unironically yeah. <laughs> want to see Alexander Dugan in conversation with Nick Land because it's like in a sort of sense they're opposites. In a sort of sense they're opposites, right? And so. There's something really interesting that could happen there as well. But the, the, the thing is, we're working with what's closest to us. And, it, and though I think I understand where Dugan's coming from a lot further than most Heideggerians, and I've got this huge background in Heidegger and Marx, I, I don't think uh, it, it, that would be further out. This is more pressing because Mikey already has taught Zizek and Lacan uh, for, prior to Theory Underground, then he, but, but through my channel. And then he just taught this course on nick land it was a banger it's been blowing up uh and now he's teaching zizek another short course on zizek uh this fall and so it's just like if that's where his, if that's where mikey's head is at like and this is where everybody's like currently at like this is just we got to do it you know um, but well, we, i mean hold, at some point hold on, hold i really want to teach greenspan but, or, or go uh, ahead sorry oh yeah well this 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 little book is is absolutely something that we need to teach and it's uh you know capitalism's transcendental time machine absolutely but i want to i want to turn it over to to spotlight on you this is about you this isn't about land mikey led with that because he's excited but uh we want to we want to ask you a variety of questions related to where you're coming from and what you've been up to um your background i don't know too much about it i saw something on the daily mail when i was looking for pictures of you and i was like and it was basically like you said you said some tweets and then you're you were suspended for it. And then you're uh, and then when they were like, why, what, when they were like, you said these things, you're like, yeah, those are good tweets. And we thought that was really funny. Um, and, and, and it's interesting. And, and it seems like I don't know. I, I kind of want you to elaborate on your trajectory a little bit on your own. But like, is that when you decided, fuck it, man, I'm just going to do my own thing? Yeah, sure. I'll give you the real quick story. Um, I'll try to keep it fast. So I was trained as a political scientist and I was a working professional political scientist for about five years in academia. Uh, I was quite successful, published in top journals. And then I got the British version of tenure. This was in England. And so like I was made permanent, like I had this, you know, job for life as a professor in England. 
Um, and so, you know, what they teach you when you're younger is like, oh yeah, if you just get tenure, then you have freedom, right? So pay your dues, climb the ladder, do everything right. And then once you have tenure, then you can finally be free. Well, I always took that very literally. I took that way too literally, <laughs> like naively so, uh, because as soon as I got the British version of tenure, which is not quite the same thing, but for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, I was made permanent. I immediately was like, okay, now I'm going to like go back to being my crazy self just as I am and as I want to be for fun. And it was very quickly clear that like you're not supposed to do that and, and it wasn't going to work out well. So basically, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it short. I had a, I, I mean, I, the, the story you're talking about that you might've read about in the news, that was sort of just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I had a rap sheet a mile long. It was, it was many other things that had accumulated. Um, so that basically at a certain point, um, yeah, I like occasionally use the word retard on Twitter. And one of the undergrads at the university I was at didn't like that. So she like reported it to my Dean and then my Dean called me in and they're like, okay, we're going to, we have to suspend you. We need to investigate. And I was just sort of like laughing at it. And I was basically like to my, in my own mind, I was just like, okay, I did not get a PhD. I did not put all of that work in and, and to prove myself as, as, you know, a kind of uh, highly educated, independent, professional uh, scholar. I did not put all of that effort in for me to now be reprimanded by like an 18 year old girl uh, making an alliance with this like 60 year old woman who's like a washed up academic. And these two women are going to like tell me what words I can use on a public platform in my own life. I was just like, no, I was like, my foot goes down here. This is, if this is what this job involves, guess what? I have other options. Uh, there's this thing called the internet and all that stuff is going well and it's a rising tide. And this academia thing feels like a sinking ship anyway. So I was just sort of like, no, this is not going to work like that. And I just chose to walk away from, from my career. Uh, I saw an opportunity. I, I believed that there was a way to carve out a new kind of independent professorship, essentially, where I could do everything that I set out to do. You know, as a professional, I could do, uh, find a way to, to port it over to the internet and uh, create an independent and uh, successful you know, uh, lifestyle as, as a reader, a writer, a thinker uh and a scholar in a way a teacher and I, I could build a profile doing it i could change the way people think independently online and i could make money doing so uh to a comfortable degree and that's what i set out to do about five years ago and that's what i've been doing and that's what i do full time dope awesome so i i guess i want to just start off with your you know your profilicity your your identity that is stated on your twitter i think it just says that you are a catholic accelerationist is that it, it maybe am I saying it in the correct order, Catherine? Yeah, I don't think any of that's too seriously. That's just like what I felt like putting this month. You know, it's just being kind of uh, creative with how you describe things. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. That that's an absolutely fair way to describe my, some of my you know viewpoint, viewpoints. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and so that's obviously a very interesting position, uh, it, and it sounds like they don't go together. And and also, by the way, just side note, I appreciate that you treat your profile that way, because that is kind of what the word profilicity <laughs> should mean, right, on the internet, is that it's not that serious. Um, but could you maybe go into how that does uh, say something for you? Well, like I said, it's not nothing too fancy or uh, preconceived. It's I am a Catholic by fact of the matter, and uh, I am an accelerationist as well. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying there's some sort of grand unified theory of which I am the uh, architect or something like that. Although, you know, we could have a fun conversation and uh, kind of produce that uh, unified theory uh, if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I guess I'll gesture to that and say that, you know, I take the Landian acceleration viewpoint to be uh, sort of pretty, pretty accurate. And in my view, the most kind of compelling social theoretical framework for thinking about technology and society today and politics and culture. You know, I, I do think that the, the kind of Landian viewpoint on technology and, and society is the, is the sort of highest leverage, most parsimonious and kind of ruthlessly rigorous and an accurate way to, to think about a lot of the, the biggest questions. So in that sense, I'm an accelerationist. Now, a lot of people associate that, though, with a kind of nihil a kind of virulent nihilism and this sort of cold, atheistic uh, kind of uh, submission to uh, kind of the, the evolutionary material 
uh, realities of the world, allowing for no kind of um, spiritual layer or 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 these other kind of uh, memes or themes associated with with a religious viewpoint. Uh, certainly, Land is uh, you know well known as as an atheist and as I said, a kind of uh, a kind of nihilist uh, in a in a you know proud sense, but. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I'm not convinced that those two, uh, that, that that all of those themes in the Landian perspective need to be so correlated. Um, I personally find quite a lot of resonance between accelerationism and, and Catholicism, uh, or at least Christianity, because, you know, I, I, I mean, I take the kind of apocalyptic uh, perspective and the Christian eschatology to quite seriously. It feels like a good fit, in fact, for for how sort of human affairs seem to be unfolding over time. It does seem like, for instance, the the, the singularity in the the accelerationist uh, register is quite similar to the Christian eschatology and the in the, the Christian and the Catholic re, uh, register. So, you know, that's one that's one sort of superficial correlation there. Um, but yeah, you know, I think I think that that there are others. I just think that the Catholicism sort of uh, or or Christian viewpoint here sort of points a lot of the ethical and spiritual kind of implications of the accelerationist model in in a different direction than, than land goes in. Um, you know, I think lands nihilistic kind of uh, atheistic per perspective, which by the way, is I think now maybe even coming into question he, a lot, a couple of his most recent essays have been strangely uniquely kind of interested in religion uh, and Christianity in particular from a favorable perspective. So someone still has to kind of tell that story. I think I'm guessing that he's still kind of figuring it out, but that's, that's a very interesting you know, uh, parenthetical right there, uh, by the way, for, for the Christian accelerationists out there, people interested in this, you know, way of thinking. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, we, I, I could say much more, but um, th those might be some initial remarks. Cadell was like, I called it because he was thinking that it would be through eschatology. Um, so, uh, okay, Mikey. You've got some questions. We probably have what a half hour. Let's 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 go. Yeah. So I, I mean, the, the first question nicely piggybacks off of what you just said, Justin. Um, I totally see the correlation on uh, when it comes to eschatology. My question for you is, as a Catholic accelerationist, how do you deal with this kind of tension that DNG and Land see between? codes and axiomatics where it seems like catholicism would be i mean depending on what type we're talking about but i mean you think about like uh the great catholic philosopher aquinas with this systematic um codification of being in a sense i mean i don't know if anybody's ever been as rigorous in, in this type of philosophy as aquinas and i see catholicism almost as the 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 purest embodiment of a religious code right uh, religious system um, seems like that is at odds with this axiomatic deterritorial the deterritorializing and decoding aspect of capital. And so, I guess the question of codes versus axiomatics is what I'm curious about or when it comes to how you're uh, how you're thinking through Catholicism and accelerationism. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I. I... I'm not sure that I really think about it in those terms. So I, I, I might have to reflect on, on that particular set of premises more to, to give you an interesting answer on there. But I guess what's at stake in your question is, is tell, tell me if this is it. It's like you're asking, you know, in the, in the Landian model and in the Deleuzian model, that capitalism is this kind of uh, highly fluid, unbounded uh, kind of creative apparatus. Whereas, uh, you have an impression of the kind of Catholic uh, catechism as this kind of uh, firmly defined set of unmoving kind of kind of ethics. Is that kind of what you're? Is that the yeah? That's what, I mean. That's fair. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, Catholicism seems to be the most rigorous um, systemization of identities, all the way up from God to inanimate objects. Um, right. I mean, to me, when I think of tradition, I think of Catholicism. And so I guess that's where I I I don't right. It right. seems like capitalism is fundamentally against tradition, which gotcha, is gotcha. yeah. And axiomatics are against codes. Right. Got it. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So yes, 
Christianity lays these kinds of rules and foundations for society, and then capitalism comes and tears them apart, essentially. You know, like Mark says, all that is all that is solid, uh, you know, uh, melts into air or whatever he says. And uh, yes, so obviously there's a conflict, and that's why this uh, notion of Christian accelerationism uh, sounds, sounds strange to people. So good question, right. I mean, what I think is that... Um, Christianity also, as Gerard says, is, is one of the only re religions that foresees its own failure, sort of encodes its own impossibility. Uh, you know, Christ himself sort of knew that his closest followers would pretty much all abandon him. And uh, there's this kind of, and, and in the Christian eschatology, in Revelation and, 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 and texts such as this, there is in, in, in the core doctrine of Christianity an, an expectation that in the end, most of humanity is going to uh, reject it, basically. Like, it's not, it's both universal and will win. And also, everything we know about humans and their society and their tendencies is going to uh, hate it and bristle against it and resist it, right? And so, in a way, um, I think it's quite... You know, to, to me, with my viewpoint as a Catholic and a Christian, it's just not at all surprising that that capitalism, you know, got out of its box and that intelligence is now kind of uh, multiplying itself without any constraint whatsoever. And, and that we now have these sort of escaped autonomous intelligences uh, in a way, capitalism itself is one that sort of operates now over and above our heads, sort of telling us what to do. And and um, it's it, it's this kind of uh, system that that has uh, has exploded its box and it is sinister um, at, at, at its core in a way. It, it's sinister, um, but it operates through this kind of extraordinary creation of wealth and and opportunity and, and freedom as well. This is, of course, the the, the Deleuzean and got guitari and kind of uh you know whole model and, and they're sensitive to this and so yeah i think basically as a christian and as an accelerationist what you say is like yeah look we know human nature we know that all of this stuff was going to eventually escape um uh th that we are fallen and and that th this is just fallen man uh kind of intensifying and and, and making all these bargains with the devil until they kind of completely get out of control. And now, now it is completely out of control. It's literally can't be put back in the box. The Christian accelerationist just simply says, now that evil has been completely let out of its box and it is autonomous, it's, it's ridiculous to say, oh, we need to try to control it and put it back in the box. The Christian accelerationist just says, okay, boys, play it, play it forward. Let's get to the end. And, and and we know what happens in the end, and, right? And so that that's that's kind of what, how I would characterize the Christian accelerationist viewpoint is. Uh, I think we have a set of ethical uh, uh, ethical sensitivities and ethical registers that are different than what someone like Nick Land has, um, but we're willing we're we're courageously willing to confront the the same empirical reality that that someone like Nick Land has astutely described. We just say. Okay, let it all accelerate, and what that and what that really is going to look like from the Christian viewpoint is a kind of divergence between what Augustine calls the city of God and the city of man, and that's what I'm seeing right now. Very clear. That's how. That's very much how I kind of. Uh, that's a lens I see society in right now, and you see it. I, I think you see it. Uh, you see that people who are oriented correctly according to human nature um, are thriving and they will continue to thrive through the acceleration and people who are disobedient to the nature of, 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 of humanity as it is essentially, you know, encoded and what, what, what you might call the natural law tradition, which is for people listening, it's sort of the, that that's essentially the kind of philosophical canon that is associated with or linked to uh, or correlated with uh, kind of Christian, uh, you know, philosophy, if you will. Um, what I'm seeing is a world where people who obey sort of the natural law are going to thrive and anyone who disobeys it are going are going to get wrecked. And, and that this divergence between those two camps is going to accelerate empirically. Like you're going to see it more and more and it's going to have more and more predictive value actually as a lens for understanding why some groups are thriving and why some groups are failing. Um, and this is kind of like the key to understanding, you know, the next 
you know, the next hundred years through the singularity. It's like, uh, I think August, Augustine saw it pretty clearly and, and, and gave us a kind of uh, model for, for, for what to expect. And so the Christian just says, accelerate because there's no putting that cat back in the bag, but you better get you and your friends and your family on, on, on the right side, which is for the Christian, you know, a kind of submission to, to um, the, the, the Christian ethical system. That was really clarifying. See, and part of it is when, when somebody uses the term accelerationist, especially in a, a Landian context, you go, well, in what sense? Because with him, especially in the 90s, you know, it's this kind of wild punk rock, destroy the human, trans, you know, let yeah. the thing. And so that's where I guess I'm like, all right, to me, Catholicism would be the, the, the most robust, systematic tradition of preserving the human and so when you say you're i'm like but it's just in saying no fuck the human destroy the human in this landian sense but i see what you're doing now where you're like no it's just this objective state of affairs that is capitalism is happening we're not getting rid of that and so you're taking a different response in how to deal with that than just you know that nothing human makes it out of the near future rock and roll uh you're saying no we need to we need to be careful about this and uh preserve what what we would define as a human yeah i mean that's a good question though we should pause on that this question of human and humanism and anti-humanism and christianity it's 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 a great question because i don't think it's as obvious as people think you know the your the way you laid it out is very sensible and, and how many people would think about it very reasonably um but i don't think christianity is uh, sort of wedded to a, a naive humanism and, and i think this is kind of worth worth thinking about in other words it looks to me like the singularity really does place real stresses on on what we traditionally think of as 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 the human uh, or humanism, and it is not at all obvious to me that a, a traditional humanism is going to make it through this bottleneck, and that you know the 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 community of of believers, the community of faith, whatever you want to call it, just uh, Christians, uh, Christian accelerationists, let's say um to make it through the bottleneck i think and i think we do want to survive i think we do want to not just survive but thrive um through all the material challenges of, of, of that we face on earth to do so we are going to probably become something other than human and i don't think that that's intrinsically sinful or intrinsically unholy or something like that or satanic it's like um you might say that to survive the singularity, um, we will we will actually become uh, le- more like God, not in a kind of uh, not in the sense of usurping God, but in the sense in the Christian sense of imitating Christ. Like I think the singularity will force Christians who are technologically and philosophically sophisticated to to really become more like Christ to such a degree. That it's almost anti-human. It's almost unhuman or inhuman, um, you know. And so, 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 you know, morphing from the the traditional human into something other than human uh, through the the challenge and the pressures of of, of acceleration uh, does not have to be uh, a bad thing. Like you're you're morphing into, you know, the you know the uh, transsexual HIV positive slime ball of like meltdown. You know, it's like. Uh, no, I mean, I, what you said just brought to mind. It's like, I mean, what is Paul's words, right? Uh, new creation in Christ Jesus, all things become new, right? You could argue like that the whole point of Christianity is to transcend the human. Yes, perfectly put. Yes, that's right. And that, that element is not widely understood by people. And, and, and I think that that's, that's a great point. You know, I think like, I you can read a text like Nick Land's Meltdown, and although it's it's kind of purposely, you know, it has a kind of dystopian kind of uh, kind of style to it or 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 imagery to it. It's also and this is what's so cool about his work is that it's it's also kind of exciting and thrilling and and liberating in a way. And and I think that I think that that's you know there's a way of reading that in a very Christian way. Like uh, you know the text talks about humanity kind of being ground down into this sort of like techno scientific um you know kind of kind of matter um but it's also kind of exhilarating and interesting and creative and so 
maybe that's also kind of what it's what it's like for humans to to really um become more like god um you know uh i don't know well i would Part love it, i would maybe. love i would love to hear you in a conversation with samuel Loncar of the becoming human project who i've had on the channel a couple of times at this point he he has a very small channel called the becoming human project I, I he teaches somewhere on the east coast and you know he he studies religion and uh philosophy in a sort of psycho uh therapeutic way you know kind of sees them both as you know the individual versus collective versions of like a basically a way of coping with with the trauma of existence blah 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 he's he's very averse to land um and his piece in the underground theory anthology that we put out last year um kind of concludes on that and 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 he you know thinks that the human must be preserved against these forces of you know destruction essentially um you you see that there could be a way that these things go together in a way that i don't think he's really considered and so there's something really interesting there well you know if you're interested in this or listeners uh interested in this who you should really read is um that guy uh pierre uh Teilhard uh pierre chardin tr uh that this is what this is the uh catholic jesuit uh priest and and, and philosopher who uh was one of the main influences on uh marshall McLuhan. uh but he's a traditional roman catholic thinker but thought very astutely about uh oh cadell what's up yeah exactly um he thought very astutely about technology and really kind of saw where a lot of this is going uh way before other people I'm not I'm not an expert on him by any means. I've I've hardly read uh, much of his work, but I but I I know only the bits and pieces here that that I'm speaking to right now. Um, you'll find a lot of stuff on this here because he's Catholic and he he pretty much sees the whole kind of accelerationist uh, future coming, and, and he and he describes it, um, you know, not in an altogether negative way from a Catholic perspective. And so, yeah, what I'm saying is not completely idios, idiosyncratic to me. There is this kind. There is a certain kind of you know, uh, Catholic tradition that I think has grappled with him. You know, what you said, Justin, it, it, yeah, sparked a thought, which is simply that, as, if I understand you correctly, the position, the, the Catholic accelerationist position would be something like this, which is, yes, the human is on the way out. You have two options for your transhumanism. You can go in this direction of Christ or you can go in this direction of the cyborg, but ultimately the choice is between these two figures of the, of transhumanism. Yeah, maybe. I think the transhumanism also, that's kind of like a, uh, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a red herring a little bit, or, or it gives people the wrong idea. Uh, most people, when they think of transhumanism, they think of this sort of, uh, you know, like, uh, again, like kind of, you know, lesbian anti-family kind of, uh, uh, cyber hacker with, you know, like machine parts in, in, in their body and stuff like this. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that the Christian, uh, orientation will point people in, in a different direction, but it, but I do, I do see a future, a, a Christian future that is highly cybernetic. It's high, it's highly digital. It's highly computerized. It's tightly integrated with things like blockchains, um, and like ruthlessly efficient, kind of uh, market phenomena and and computerized systems to the point that is you know from some from a certain perspective perhaps it could be seen as oppressive or or anti-human um but from a slightly different perspective it's like it is just the kind of universalist integration of of of, of all people um into ever increasing levels of uh, intelligence and essentially you know uh, kind of convergence with god so that's that would be more i would think less along the lines and themes associated with transhumanism and more uh along the lines that i just described but you could absolutely describe what i described just now as a kind of christian transhumanism if you wanted to yeah okay dave i i one more like theory question for justin and then i'll hand it over to you um okay justin first off i've never gotten to talk to a landian before somebody is it, it, interested in land as you are and um mm. but as a catholic i think this makes this question even more interesting okay i mean i i i guess i could guess but i just what are your thoughts on the ccru's the whole thing with the occult the demon lemurs all of that and how do you what do you understand 
a, a lemur to be for them. Uh, <laughs> I have my theories of how it all fits together, but I'm really curious to know what you think of the occult and the. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, and by the way, folks, to be clear, I mean, I'm I'm like I I think of myself as you know I, I'm interested in philosophy and and social science and understanding the truth first and foremost before I'm a Christian. Frankly, I mean, I I came to I came around to Christianity as part of you know my own just adult mature search for what what really is true to be clear so you know i i have no problem kind of you know discussing my christian viewpoints or how i how i think that through or whatever but um just for people who are maybe listening to me talk for the first time i'm you know I, i'm not speaking from primarily from the perspective of, of a christian i'm speaking i always do all my writing and all my thinking in my entire life from the perspective of just someone trying to kind of figure out the radical truth to the best of my ability um and it just so happens that only really quite recently in the past you know 10 years um ha has that kind of led me to become increasingly convinced of, of of kind of the christian philosophy that's just a bit of a a, a preface there just uh, and, and and so um having said that though what i would say is that um uh sorry i just lost the thought say it one more time just jog my memory just your thoughts on their their how they utilize the occult uh, the occult they call oh, yeah yeah that's right that's right that's right so uh, so frankly that element of the ccru just never really excited me personally i never i mean i i understand some of it a, a lot of it i think um i do think that it's kind of um what you see with a lot of secular or atheist kind of philosophies is that at a certain level of intensity they always need to sneak some kind of religion in the back door this is, and to me, this is kind of a kind of vindication of, I, th I think you see this across the board. I mean, it's, it's very hard to find a, a kind of secular, a truly atheistic or secular thinker who um, hits a certain level of genuine intensity and then uh, does not, you know, kind of verge onto something that sure as heck looks a lot like uh, kind of religion. Kind of and the point, God is not dead, God is unconscious. Mm, there you go. It's uh, a good line. And so I think that's, in my opinion, that's, I think what you're seeing with the CCRU there. Um, I think that it look this looks to me like, you know, radical kind of atheistic uh, philosophers who get on a really good thing. They go really far and figure some things out and they kind of hit this sort of line of flight um, very admirably and very excitingly. I, I, I love the work of the CCRU. Um, and then before you know it, they, they, they just, without even trying, uh, because they start trafficking in sort of spiritual elements. Uh, and in my view, when you, when you notice that all of that always happens with secular or atheistic philosophies, I think, I think what it asks you to do is it asks you to take a step back and think like, oh, well, um, yeah, okay, maybe we could like invent our own like incredibly new idiosyncratic kind of like religious, you know, uh, theoretical technologies, like, you know, the, the numogram and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, maybe, or maybe the, you know, perennial tendency for all secular philosophies beyond a level of intensity to, to converge on some sort of religious framework. Maybe that actually just vindicates and, and kind of testifies to um, kind of the, the ultimate kind of religious structure uh, at the bottom of things. Um, and if you think that, if you think that, if you do think that there is a kind of religious structure at the bottom of things, as the CCRU does, because, um, you know, for people listening, that's, they have this kind of idea that um, there are these kind of mystical numerical structures. There's this kind of fundamental creativity that can be accessed, like a, a kind of creativity over the world in a way, over social reality that can be accessed through a kind of certain uh, uh, esoteric manipulation of numbers and 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 things like this. Um, you know, uh, I personally would rather bet on you know, the longest standing and most kind of philosophically justified and sophisticated version of that, basically, you know, um, and so I'd rather put my money on, you know, uh, Augustine and Aquinas and Christ than, you know, some professors uh, on amphetamines in the 1990s, as cool as they were, and as smart and interesting as they were, and as much as I like them, I'm not going to bet on their kind of religious inventions okay <laughs> that um that that's kind of that's kind of how how i see it um yeah i guess my, I, it's it's funny because i i i get asked this a lot and i in the course i the last lecture was on how i interpret all the occult stuff but i get asked well what's the 
basically, what's the metaphysical status of the lemurs? Are do they think there's actual demons out there in the outside, and somehow you can channel them, or is it all hyperstition? Where in fact the 45 lemurs, and this is kind of, it, it. they hint at this where they talk about, yeah, but the 45 lemurs make up one entity. And you're like, are, are they AI programs in the singularity from the future? Um, somehow okay, right. the aspects of the singularity. And that's kind of, when you piece it together, you start going, no, I think they're, because, I mean, Kurtzweil and all those guys, they talk about how once AI hits, it'll just keep generating other AIs. And it's almost like a multitude of codes or personas within the singularity itself would be K tax and all the other ones. But right. I don't so, know. Good question. Good question. And I, 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 I'll try to answer this as head on as possible. I mean, in my take, uh, in my, my reading of it all, I, I do see, um, I don't see the lemurs as these kind of um, like transcendental, like, um, demons or characters kind of in like the structure of things, but more on your, your second choice there, the, that, that it is essentially all hyperstitional. Um, you know, I think the lemurs are cool. I like, I'm on the team, I'm on team lemur. Okay. You know, and there, so for people listening, the whole, the whole kind of, uh, uh, CCRU, uh, imaginarium roughly, uh, you know, kind of breaks the world into camps of, you know, kind of, um, you know, liberating creative, uh, forces that are kind of generally on one side fighting, you know, systems of control and oppressive, you know, uh, institutions and chronologies and and so on. And so the lemurs are in this camp of of, of entities and themes and images that 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 are associated with uh, kind of rebellion uh, against, you know, the uh, the 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 dominant uh, architectonic. Of, of time and all of that. And so, yeah, I'm definitely team lemur and I think they're cool, but I do think that they're essentially hyperstitional. I think with the CCRU, it's all, you know, it's pretty, I think it's just bio, like biographically and, and, and psychographically, it's clear what they're doing. Like they're highly creative people. They have this kind of theoretical uh, gloss on the world, which is very compelling. Uh, and they realize that, oh, you know, fiction and art um, and symbols can be sort of conceived uh, more or less ex nihilo and, 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 and wrapped around them can, can be entirely new worlds and stories that then can get social currency and then can create the things that, you know, they, they allude to. Right. And so th this is, this is probably their key kind of defining sort of like creative uh, realization or insight and that they're, that they're milking. Right. And so they realize like, Oh, cool. So we can just like make things up and have fun and create this world. Um, which is not completely made up. It's it's tracking certain, you know, themes in the in the in the collective unconscious or what have you. Um, but yeah, the lemurs are just a funny, really fun. Oh, and it's it's drawn from um, uh, Burroughs, I believe, if I recall correctly. That's the, that's the real source text for for that. Um, uh, yeah, and so I see them. I see them as a fun, interesting, cool thing. But it's a um, it's all it's, I, yeah. I think for the CCRU, it, it's all cybernetic. It's all autopoietic. Um, I don't think they want to kind of uh, grant any other deeper reality to any of it. I don't think. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that... I, I'm, I'm, I, I got the impression that, I mean, cause they, they liken the singularity to a Lovecraftian deity. It's we can joke about Mecca Cthulhu or something. And so it's the same thing with these, you know, Oh, well the, the CCRU's Necronomicon is uh, the true Necronomicon. Yeah. And so ultimately you start going, no, I, th I still think that the, the lemurs are more of, some way connected to the singularity um as opposed to actual ancient demons from like what the key of solomon is solomon or whatever so uh so can i say one more thing which i yeah, think is ahead. important can i throw something else on yeah so yeah, yeah. just want to throw add this that um on some level i would grant kind of like this religious um, you know, kind of mechanism that the CCRU sees with the, with the all the occult stuff and the numogram and all that. Like on some level, I think they're kind of right empirically. Like they are, they are right. Like you, a, a small group of people aligned on certain ideas and themes and aesthetics, reading the same novels and writing to each other. Like a small group of people can actually bootstrap their own 
kind of um, religious machinery. I, I do think that that's available to human beings. So, and, and, and I think that that's what they're sensing. That's what they're discovering with all the hyperstition and all of this. And so they start realizing like, oh, we can create these number systems with a, we can create a new number system. And through that, we can generate all these interesting kind of social dynamics. Like on some level, I'm willing to grant all of that as, as empirically accurate um, uh, stories about like the human mind and human societies and how we function re religiously and, and, and how that can structure, you know, future realities. Um, I would grant all of that empirically. What's, uh, but I think as what I, when I think about all of that from a large, I take a step back and evaluate that philosophically, my mind just says, well, okay, sure. It's probably possible you can spin up a numogram and do all this weird kooky stuff, but do you want to? Is that really the best way to use these powers and and these and these capabilities that we have as humans? I don't think so. Um, I would rather find the universal uh, kind of codex. The, I would I'd rather rather find the universal um, you know substrate that is most likely to align the largest number of people um, to the highest kind of philosophical and aesthetic uh, level. And, and take as much of the entire global population as possible um, into, yeah, you know, into an ever improving uh, quality of life and, and salvation. Uh, and so that's what I see. So basically I would kind of grant all their occult stuff, but I would say if that is in fact available to all human beings, I would, it's much better for us to all just agree to use those powers on the one, you know, truly, most beautiful um, unifying universalist version of that. I, I would say that's philosophically and politically and theoretically uh, a superior option. Base. So I have a couple questions. I will actually, I think we're, how much more time do you think you have here? Um, I have a little bit, if you, if, if you don't mind my son kind of being in the background a little bit, I could go a little bit no, longer, not at all. There, but not at uh, all. Yeah, I have to. I have to go relieve my wife in uh, five minutes, but uh, we can drag it on a little bit longer if you want. Oh, for Try. sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, I'm the pronatalist here, so I'll say that's fine. Okay. Um, the uh, I guess I have a question about hyperstition, and I, these are both very. Actually, you know what? You answered the first. You you answered the question about hyperstition. I don't have to ask it. Uh, we ha uh, I know that uh, Mikey had a question about Bitcoin. He wanted to get into, uh, but first, I just wanted to say. Do you believe in that the singularity uh, is in the future, uh, retroactively working things toward it? And do you believe that that techno-capitalist singularity is the god of Catholicism, or is it something different? Yeah, I don't have, again, I don't have some sort of like really worked out model of it, but that is my intuition. That's something like that is my intuition. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the, the Christian idea is that God gave us freedom and God gave us free will um, for us for us to figure these things out on our own. And but also God is, you know, God, God relates to us like like we relate to to children, uh, to our own children. And so it's like, you know, with your child, you want to give you want to give them freedom because you want them to rise and fall on their own. Uh, they need that. You want that. It's It's the right thing to do. It's the right that's what's fit to human nature uh but you're also watching your kids and you know if if they're if the kids if the kids really fuck up real bad for a really long time you know you're going to intervene and you're going to pull them back you, you know you're going to pull them back because you love them you know uh i do think it's it's pretty much precisely that with you know uh our our relationship to god i think um who knows what it's really like but that uh, to me that's the best bet that that's a good bet uh the best bet i know i know of and I think what you're seeing is precisely that like w our job was to keep this capitalism thing in its box. Uh, we messed up the job. It got out of its box and now it's going to kind of, you know, we're, we're all as a species going to rush headlong to um, ever increasing wealth and power and knowledge and also ever increasing brutality and destruction and, and, and coldness. And, both of those things are, are going to be increasingly true uh, until, um, you know, all of the sinners are completely destroyed and all of the faithful are um, left standing, at which point um, we will, you know, um, everything will be rectified 
Um, and in a way, yes, I, I do think on some level, um, the God that created us um, is also the God that is um, pulling us uh, back towards him uh, through, through some kind of uh, chronology that uh, is not at all our kind of quotidian uh, chronology. Yeah, I, I think something like that is true. At this point, like I'm freaked out. Mikey's got me thinking, you know, what if, what if the singularity, because it can work outside of, or go back in time, like Yahweh is actually the singularity just doing its thing. It's just like, I don't know. There's all kinds of crazy stuff, but, uh, I want to say yeah. we bracket the Mikey's questions about Bitcoin and mega cities. I say we bracket those. I want Nance and Cadell to each get a chance to. Uh, ask you a question here. So this is kind of like Q and A for the last five minutes. Cadell and uh, Nance, you guys could turn your cameras on. I want to ask Mike, yeah. one. If I I can finish that. They don't care if he's wrong. Yeah. Hey, what's up? So you can go upstairs. What do you say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to ask one question. It's not a big theory question, uh, Justin. So I got a copy of the new edition of Xeno Systems Fragments. Okay. And it says and gift from the lemurs i don't find a text in here called a gift from the lemurs am i being duped here what do you mean i don't, well, I don't the, the, the title it acts like the original title of the book was xeno system xeno systems fragments the new edition is titled xeno systems fragments and a gift from the lemurs so i was expecting a new text to be included in this new edition but there's no text called the gift from the lemurs Oh, maybe so, there's some kind of maybe there's some kind of Easter egg in there that you don't understand. That's that's what I was hoping you'd say. So I I have no insight into that though. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Cadell. Welcome, Nance. Hey, right. how's it going? Um, so I know time is limited. I do have a quick yep. question. Hey, yep. hey, so, Cadell. What's up, man? Hey Justin, yeah, long time no talk. Um, yeah, I loved, uh, I loved listening in on this. This was fantastic. There are so many ideas flying through my head, but the the most important one is that I, I'm probably going to be teaching on a uh, Teilhard de Chardin this year, and I was I was interested in your perspective on specifically coming at transhumanism and accelerationism from a Catholic perspective. Are there any thinkers you know of that come from a Protestant or an Eastern Orthodox perspective that have approached accelerationism and potentially transhumanism in a way that might be interesting to compare and contrast with Teilhard de Chardin? Hmm. It's a good question. I'm I'm searching my mind at the moment, but no 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 one comes to mind. But there absolutely could be. Um, I mean. Luther, maybe <laughs> I would look into Luther. I'd see what he, I would see what he had to say. Um, but yeah, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. All right. If, if if something does come to mind, I'd be interested. But anyway, I'm super super uh, um, super interested in the way you're playing with these ideas. It's extremely counterintuitive, and uh, I think quite helpful. So. Well, Great thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's encouraging me to yeah go deeper, maybe. Nance, what you got, man? I I think uh, similarly, it's been super interesting, uh, and there's so much. Um, it's kind of difficult to to find one question, but so from your perspective, it, it would be the case that capital and all the silly things we've done, humans, uh, is a consequence of our. <clears throat> iniquity right like our failures to to reach the ideal or however god's god's plan for us um so would you know the breakdown with the singularity would that be i mean here on earth or would that be some type of phase transition to a paradise or or on on the back end of the coming calamity um would we be still here or, or would we be in some, some type of paradise? Yeah, it's a obviously tricky question of theology that I don't pretend to have super strong opinions on. I mean, I think 
the whole question of the afterlife in my in my opinion is you know i think a little bit more difficult than than people especially christian people want to talk about i don't you know i i, I i'm not completely certain that to be a christian absolutely commits one to a strong you know statement about about the afterlife or what that even means or involves um so my you know there could be some afterlife but i mean, frankly i mean i, I consider myself a, a real christian but i don't i don't really feel um too convicted about anything related to what happens after we die i just don't know and i think when you look at the when you look, I mean, I, I know the teachings and I know, I know the, the ideas that a Christian, uh, you know, is committed to kind of pertaining to the afterlife. But when you actually start looking at the word afterlife and the history of this idea of the afterlife, you start to realize like what is meant by that is, is very, is very unclear. So we take it for granted now today, today, uh, people who, you know, Christians or just people who talk about Christianity People talk as if it's obvious that, oh, yeah, of course, the Christian thinks that when you die, you go to heaven. Heaven is this place where you're like reunited with all the other people who died, who went to heaven. And it's like maybe it's in the clouds or maybe it's like, you know, it's like uh, you have everything you ever wanted. All these different like themes that that people kind of take for granted about what heaven even means. But if, when you look at like the if you look at the history of like Christian theology, it's a, it's actually a pretty late invention. I don't, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, for 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 centuries there was no real um, like shared discussion or shared understanding of of this like theme or this this type this understanding of the afterlife. It it, it only gets introduced um, at a certain point. Uh, and so there's nothing particularly sort of given about it. And and you start looking at the words, you start looking at like the Greek and the this and the that and like what's actually meant by all this stuff. It's incredible. It starts it starts dissolving in your hands basically. So it's not a very helpful answer. But but my point is to say that I don't think you know um, a sophisticated Christian today has to have any particularly compelling an- like like clear committed answer on 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 any of that. I, I see it as a mystery. I think the, the Christian faith is very um uh interesting and and admirable in that it has these these mysteries but but it's honest enough to call them mysteries you know a lot of a lot of these things are supposed to be understood as mysteries they're not supposed to um you know require you to say some positive statement about what it is and then you sound stupid to all your like you know scientifically trained friends like i'm not i you know, I refuse to take that bait on on questions where it's like just very not that you're giving me bait. I just mean, I, I think it's wise for the for the sophisticated, reflective Christian to um, just not overcommit to to anything that that doesn't really make sense, actually, and and that and that is unclear. So, um, I'm I'm a little agnostic on that specific thing. I, I just don't understand. But I'll say one other quick thing. Um, and by the way, my I I, I can I can talk. I'm not in a rush. So, uh, it's that. I've always I've always tended to see the Christian concept of the afterlife as essentially a kind of uh, equivalent to what we today would call in the scientific in this the scientific parlance sort of just like equal like long run equilibrium. OK, like the long run, the concept of a long run equilibrium, the idea that a system with certain parameters or, or certain variables set to certain values will over time tend to reach a certain state. That idea was obviously not available to anyone before whatever the 1700s or something like that. So I've always kind of had this inkling myself that heaven, hell, the idea of all of the ideas of the afterlife and the Christian faith are really just like a super, super smart early uh, encoding of this idea that systems can have these abstract tendencies. They can have these abstract endpoints, which are not materially real in any way. But they are just where a system will go after a certain amount of time passes if nothing else changes. To me, heaven and hell and the idea of the afterlife is like a really powerful way of, of maybe just saying that. Uh, and so, so it's kind of saying like if you're living in sin, you're, go- you're going to hell in the long run because people who live in sin are going to have really bad things happen to them over and over again the more time passes. So that if you just extrapolate that out into its abstraction – the, the abstraction is hell when you play that out to the maximum, like on a long enough timeline. I've always kind of had an inkling that that's what the afterlife means in the Christian faith as just like, and it's like super, super compelling and intelligent in that regard. So I'll cut myself off there. I hope that, you know, is illuminating or helpful in some way. Uh, that I like that a lot. 
<clears throat> and I've had a lot of thoughts about religion kind of along those kinds of lines, as in like there's there's something and we know that there's something there. And so we we come up with some kind of a language for it. And I think that you were getting at something really important when you were talking about the. Uh, there is equipment available to humans working in groups. And, you know, this was something that they were discovering at CCRU. And it's something that people working in groups are able to figure out, you know, but there are also tried and true uh, systems and that, you know, thinking about religions this way, I think it just makes it really opens up the the history of, of world religions. But with that said, I, um, Mikey, now you get to ask uh, one of those two questions, Bitcoin or megacities, because, I mean, we, he said he has a time. Let's do it. Are you there? Sorry, yeah, I've lost my question here. I'm grabbing it. Let me see. We can't just say Bitcoin Go. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Justin, I mean, we could have a whole another discussion at some point talking about blockchain. I'd love to pick your brain on that. Yeah. Um, I guess I've had, I recently had a discussion with a friend of mine. Uh, he, he's far more pessimistic in his view on Bitcoin and blockchain as a technology. And he got me to watch this video. Uh, basically I'm still pretty new to blockchain. Um, so he, he sent me down a YouTube rabbit hole. I watched the line goes up video. Um, I'm just curious about where you're at with it. Um, what do you think of these type, uh, you know, especially a video like line goes up that says, no, this technology is intrinsically flawed. It's not going to, do what it does like what, what basically what's your response to people who have that type of criticism i mean i think it's fine to have uh reasonable uh differences of opinion about particular blockchains uh or you know what's most interesting or what's going to be most valuable for society over the long run i think those they're, they're, they're very reasonable you know differences of opinion you can have there i know incredibly smart people who think Bitcoin is, you know, the the most important thing, and it will be for the long time, for you know, for a very long time. And I know very, very smart people who think it's going to go to zero. So I think it's just, I mean, frankly, the very fact that there's such polarization among the smartest people, to me, is just interesting and compelling. Like, like that, whatever happens, that that that's a proof enough to me that this space is very significant in one way or another. Um, uh, even if the, you know the jury's still out on how exactly, um, because if it was if it was, it's just very rare that the smartest people have such strong disagreements about about something that's new. That's one observation. But the other is, um, you know, I think it. I think you can have differences of, of viewpoint on whether a particular blockchain is going to matter or be valuable in the long run. But I don't think I I really don't think you can make much of a case that the underlying technology, the fundamental innovation of, of these sort of self-enforcing distributed ledgers, I don't, I just don't think you can make the argument that that's not going to be profoundly impactful on society and, and the economy, uh, just because it fits so perfectly within a, a obvious kind of historical gradient of, um, you know, the, as we've been talking about with the history of capitalism, essentially that it, it, the history of capitalism is about the increasing autonomy of of markets and of intelligence itself. And, and so it, it's just the, 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 the distributed ledgers fits so tightly and cleanly on this gradient as the next level of, of the becoming autonomous of capital, uh, that I think, frankly, especially if you're schooled in all this stuff that we're talking about and you're, you know, you're reading Nick land and you're, and you, and, and you're well read up on, on your marks and all of this, it's like, uh, I, I think it's, 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 I just don't see how you could not believe that something here is world historical and will have uh, a, a, some kind of disruptive impact um, on the economy and society S akin to, let's say, the joint stock corporation or akin to, let's say, the Internet itself. Um, you know, these the, these are each kind of waypoints on the history of capital that had clear un value unlocks um, that, that changed the fabric of things. Um, I, I, I'm personally, you know, I, I consider myself strongly convinced that, that the blockchain as, as is an example of that. And, and, and I just, I find it very hard to believe that, that someone, uh, you know, could really reject that, that, that form of the, of the argument. 
You know, and it's it's funny. I recently just before I taught the land course, I hadn't really dived into cryptocurrent, and now that I am, uh, that's one of the best things he's ever written. And it's incredibly underrated. Yes, it is, and I'm still working out the de- so. I know this is a big question, so if you want to go, okay, another time maybe. But I am curious to know how you so land gives Bitcoin this incredible like ontological status of how it affects time. And that it makes absolute succession possible. How do you understand that? What What is his claim there? Yeah, this idea of absolute succession. It's very strange. Um, I'll try to give you, you know, how I would think about that. Uh, and I should say, guys, this this will be my last one, if that's all right. I, I appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this. Um, so he has this idea that, that yeah, blockchains are, are artificial time. It's, a, it's the first kind of artificial time machine. Not in the sense of time travel, but in the sense of, uh, sort of the production of time and it, it, it's it's an interesting sort of it's a really interesting statement uh, because it sort of r- reminds you that you know time is not this obvious it's not an obvious thing at all it's not we it's not really clear what what time is necessarily philosophically there's many different ways you can kind of try to make sense out of that um, but time as we know it as humans and generally like you look at the history of time like the history of technologies for timekeeping and this sort of thing it's a history where time is always being pinned down to something else it's all it's always being sort of fixed for our convenience by correlating it to something else you know so it's like we think about like the sun going up and the sun going down right um uh there's m- many you know or or whatever the the movements of, of the bodies uh the planets or what have you and so um but there's also this time with this problem with time where it's always like there's always slippage right so we have things like uh, you know, uh, daylight savings, right? And we have things like um, leap years, right? We have all these weird little things where A, we're trying to fix time to, to things that are not time. And B, there's always these weird slippages where we have to do this like ad hoc correction to to keep things, you know, uh, consistent. And, and basically what he's saying with blockchains is, because what a blockchain, all the blockchain really does is it ver- it validates a succession of of stamps like time stamps basically at, the, at on some level that's way a simple way to, to understand what what the what a distributed ledger is it's all it's really saying is that here's the ordering here's the sequence of blocks in this order that ha- that that were added over time here's the one true correct one that all of the other people holding bitcoin acknowledge to be the one true correct succession of of blocks that that's really all it can do but that gives you digital money, self-enforcing digital money, because it solves the double spend problem. It means like you can't move a token from one account into another, you know, into another account and also say that it's in another account. Like you can't lie about who has what money. Um, and you can get that property simply from the a truly correct ordering of time. Um, but basically, yeah, so the, the, the blockchain is this sort of, timekeeping system that does not refer to anything else it doesn't it doesn't have to pin itself to the movement of the sun or or what have you um is it a failed it's, it's, clock, it, basically? It, it's a completely self-enforcing system of timekeeping uh and that's i think what he means by by absolute succession um yeah it's fascinating so basically like a fail proof clock in a way but but also one that's like completely self-enforcing um which is which is strange, but anyway, that book is really underrated. I highly recommend it. It's fascinating and fun read. Um, it basically just tries to kind of pull out all of the philosophical kind of um, implications of of what this what this blockchain is. Um, Bitcoin is primarily what he writes about, but that's kind of you know just a, a function of, of of where it was in time. And it's not clear if it it you know only applies to Bitcoin or not. Uh, but hey, guys, this was really fun. And by the way, I, once again, I'm sorry that I was late. It was incredibly disrespectful. I just totally messed up. And uh, please forgive me. But um, this was really fun and I appreciate your thoughtful questions. And uh, when the time is right, some other time, I would love to learn more about what you all are doing. Like I want to learn more about, you know, this, this just seems like a cool little organization and little, little culture you have. Um, Cadell and I know each other a little bit from some of the stuff that I've organized, but I'm always super curious to know about other people's systems and what kinds of, what, what, what you're doing as a community and how you run it and uh, your practices and, and where you're going with it all. I find that stuff super interesting. It seems like you all have a really cool thing going on here. So some other time I'd love to talk more about, you know, what, what, what everyone's up to. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you, man. Appreciate all the good questions. Take it easy, everyone. Take care.
All right. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes uh, for a post game. Then I'm going to go see a movie with my sweetheart, you know, the whole thing. So the uh, I'm really excited for this new movie. It's called, uh, uh, is it ISS? It's called ISS for International Space Station. Do you guys, you all know about this movie? Oh my God. It's right in line with uh, Leave the World Behind. It's right in line with that Civil War movie. And basically, there's a bunch of Russians and Americans. They're in a, the International Space Station. And, you know, the, the, the trailer opens by saying that this was always a collaboration between the U.S. and Russia. And uh, so they're up there and they're just goofing around having fun. And then they, the, one of the gals, she's like looking down at Earth and she sees this light and then light and then light. And the, so they're watching war break out while they're up there. And pretty much the whole Earth just gets wrecked while they're up at the International Space Station. And then, of course, it turns out that certain people aboard have a mission to actually take over um, from up there. And and then there's, of course, people up there who want to work together. And, of course, you don't know who's who. So there's kind of that among us kind of component. And so I'm just really excited about this movie because like Leave the World Behind was like, it's pretty cool. Like it was, it was, it was, it was kind of sensationalized, blah, 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 blah. But no, I'm, I'm the, the, the Leave This World Behind and uh, Civil War and uh, ISS, all three of these are about the same thing. And which is basically uh, everybody wants to kill each other, or at least they've been kind of duped into thinking maybe that's necessary. And I'm freaked out by it. I want to write an essay about it. And uh, so that's why I want to go see this. What are you going to say there, Nance? I, I know you got something. <laughs> I, uh, I ate some gummies and started watching For All Mankind, I think is what it's, it's the, the retell, like the reimagining of the Cold War space race. And I'm like six episodes in. Uh, it was, I was enthralled with this show. I couldn't go to bed. Um, but I, I, I think it, yeah, it is kind of weird that there, there's a lot of media coming out right now that uh, is overly fascinated with this idea of like a, a, a new civil war or uh, a reignition of the Cold War or whatever. But yeah, that movie sounds cool. And it reminded me of the For, For All Mankind show that it's really cool. So I want to I want to close out with two things. One is I want you guys to talk about the things you wish you could have talked to Justin about, like other questions that came up. I know, Cadell, you've got something so we can kind of bring up those kind of like because the idea is that the saying always overflows is said. So let's put some stuff out to kind of get it simmering so that we can kind of come back to it later and do do more on this. And that'll be towards our closing thoughts. And then I also want to quilt everything with the response to the idea that. I'm a, I'm a self-entitled chill. I think we should close on that comment because uh, I, I know that we shouldn't give the trolls the, 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 the bait, but I actually think that the contradiction here is illuminating and that it, it brings the focus back to what this is ultimately about, which is that I am a shill. So let's, let's uh, but first of all, uh, let's, uh, what, what do you wish you had asked uh, Justin uh, Cadell? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I was thinking about what Mikey said about the body without organs as a virtual reservoir of potentials within our bodies. And when I was thinking about that in the context of what Justin Murphy was saying about what it seemed to me to be the virtual potential of our future body, is like, is our is the option between Christ and a transsexual slime ball? Because that seemed to be like the way he was uh, depicting it. It's like this, either with the virtual potential of Christ or the virtual potential of a transsexual slime ball. And uh, let me get the quote. That's it's it's from Meltdown. Hold on. And I, I wanted to quickly link this to Alenka is actually going to be coming to Philosophy Portal this Monday, and I was reading her well rereading her article is sex passe in in underground theory. And she makes a really interesting point in that article that there's a type of weird historical circle between repression and sexual excess. 
And she frames it as the cultural repression of libido versus the anti-cultural libido. And that there's some sort of weird circle between these two processes. And it seems to me like Christ and the transsexual slime ball would be good models for this system. So I was just like seeing if there's any connection there ultimately between the these lines of thought. All right. So here's the quote. It's from Meltdown. It's in Fang Numina, page 456. <clears throat> Meltdown has a place for you as a schizophrenic, HIV positive, transsexual, Chinese, Latino, STEM addicted LA hooker <clears throat> with implanted mirror shades and a bad attitude. Blitzed on a polydrug mix of K Nova, synthetic serotonin, and female orgasm analogs, you have just iced three Turing cops with a highly cinematic 9mm automatic. The residue of animal twang in your nerves transmits imminent quake catastrophe. Zero is coming in, and you are on the run. I, I think that's going to be the Catholics, too. I don't know. <laughs> that character just described was probably Catholic. Let's be honest. It's probably Justin Murphy's friend. I don't know. But um, uh, I'm glad you elaborated with the quote, actually, because I wasn't sure. I didn't remember. I was just like, I was like, hmm, interesting. So, uh. Yeah, any other kind of closing thoughts or questions you guys had on this this whole line of thought? This uh, land, Murphy, accelerationism, Catholicism. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I could dig up some other questions, but I really got my core questions for Justin asked, so I was happy about that. I want to say, like, Zizek's been talking a lot about apocalypse and, like, the difference between apocalypse with and without kingdom. And I, I think like this is also coming up as well in 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 this distinction between Christian accelerationism is like apocalypse with kingdom or apocalypse without kingdom. Yeah, it's interesting that Zizek is doing this Christian atheism thing that is totally materialist, and over here we have Justin Murphy doing uh, Christian Landianism. It's it's, it's it it's fascinating i don't know i don't really know i feel like today, well, I today this is the year of people trying to theology pill me it really is uh i know that there are like 15 conversations lined up for me this year of various people from various theological uh proclivities backgrounds uh who are who have this vested interest in talking to me about it. Uh, the, one of the ones I'm most excited about is Samuel Loncar, Become a Human Project. He wants to talk to me about the course. He wants to teach at Theory Underground. I offered this, by the way. It wasn't like he was like, hey, I want to teach this. I was like, you should teach a course on this, which is uh, Theology for Atheists, which is like, well, you 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 know, if you come from a strict uh, sect or a, 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 you know, one of these traditions that's, that has a particular reading of things and has told you a bunch of definitions for things, but you haven't done theology and you're being an atheist. Well, then, you know, here's a class on how to be an atheist because he's an atheist of a sort. Um, but it's kind of like he doesn't think that most atheists are atheists and uh, thinks that, you know, some education is necessary. And so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in a few other things along those lines. I know that we've got Mark Murphy. Uh, he will be here eventually. We've been talking, um, and uh, there's there's a few others as well. Uh, but with that said, okay, yeah, Mikey, go for it. No, I was just gonna say I would I would really like to see a conversation between Justin Murphy and Mark Murphy, right? I mean, you get Landian Catholic and the Lacanian Catholic. I mean, that would be a, a fun discussion right there. Mm, for sure. And and they're both called Murphys, so you could, I mean, there's something there. There's probably some meme value. I don't know if anybody saw the meme that I already made for the conversation, um, but you know, you got to check out the meme. It's it's the most recent one on my Instagram. It's also on the YouTube community page. It's very inappropriate. I, after putting the meme up, I realized it's kind of awkward because my uh, well, Anne's mother actually follows me on Instagram and. 
it's awkward because it's like one of these, you know, like a sort of porn uh, meme. It's I'm going to hold it up to the to the screen here. It's not it's not bad or anything, but it's like it's showing the guy who's like laying on his back and then she's doing reverse uh, cowgirl and, and, and he's got the laptop up in front of her back and he's watching us having our conversation with Justin, you know, <laughs> this, this meme is just blowing up right now. So of course, but, um, well, okay, everybody. So a lot of you don't know too much about theory underground. Uh, I'll roll the PSA at the end here. It should give you all a little bit more of a chance to, to know a bit more about it. Um, Cadell is doing education online through philosophy portal. I'm doing education online through theory underground. Theory Underground has been around for a whopping year, but of course, there were decades, well, at least a decade of work that went into what what it eventually became. We could say that a lot of those prior projects were sublated into what it became. And uh, this includes uh, the U.S. tour that we did already in September of last year, uh, the anthology Underground Theory with over 31 contributors here, uh, as well as my book, Time energy, why you have no time or energy. It's uh, existential, phenomenological, structural uh, analysis of the conditions for one, the good life, and two, what what ruins the good life. That is our reduction as human beings into this commodity form called labor power. Um, and my pre my previous book was called Waypoint: uh, Time, Energy, Critical Media Theory, and Culture War. Justin Murphy actually almost wrote a preface to it, but he was super busy at the time. And uh, I, it, Elton LK ended up writing the preface. It was just, he was, he was itching to do it. And so I went for that option because Justin was pretty busy and I didn't know if that was going to, how long it would take. Um, but the reason I'm waving Waypoint around, I don't normally talk about this book, right? This is, it's still under my old name, Theory Pleep, right? I used that name when I was more of a lefty influencer or whatever. Well, Waypoint uh, is a collection of my thoughts leading up to the Time Energy book. It includes a uh, piece of my my master's thesis um, where I developed the concept of time energy, which is essentially in, in very simplistic terms, um, large energy infused repeatable blocks of time that are reliably available week to week throughout your whole your whole life. That, that is the precondition for being able to learn multiple languages and play multiple instruments and go and dance and do jujitsu and ride your bicycle and play with friends and fight and you know, be in bands. I mean, really all of the cool things while still being a philosopher, like the, the condition of possibility for that kind of a lifestyle would be time energy. It's not, it's what we all lack. Uh, and so it's what we all ultimately come together around here, but underground theory is a much broader thing than, than theory underground. Cadell is a part of underground theory. Justin Murphy is a part of underground theory. Everybody is a part of underground theory if they're here. <laughs> Right. The, the, the underground theory is just the fact that it's outside of academia. It's on the Internet. It's in back alleys, whatever. I don't know. But uh, theory underground is this trying is the to seem to mill you. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. Seemed, so the, seem to mill you. theory underground is trying to take the scene, the underground theory scene into an intellectual milieu, not not trying to totalize the field and then capture it and take it all into its own thing. No, trying to foster the conditions for an intellectual milieu to to come out of this the most anti-intellectual point in human history right and so uh I, I i think that a lot of us here are a part of that process i think that uh the piece that i just wrote on scenes versus milieus uh that is going to go into cadell's anthology is something i look forward to talking about with you all here and as well as on his channel hopefully soon i mean the very you know presentation on that came out of a conference i did at philosophy portal um, but this May and October are two very exciting times for theory underground and for the larger underground theory scene that, that gives a shit. And that is to say that we're going on tour in Europe. We're going to be meeting up with Cadell, doing events in three locations. If you are in Paris, Brussels, or <clears throat> Brussels. I guess three the three events we're doing are in those two places. Um, if and you're maybe in London. 
Well, we're definitely doing stuff in London, but the question is, is will we be doing the stuff that you're talking about? So there's different things happening in London. There will be definitely a public event in London at Alfie's Pub that you can all come to. That's Alfie Bone of Sublation Media and Everyday Analysis. Um, but the, yeah, no, there will be like these smaller uh, meetups in Paris and Brussels. Uh, you basically have to reach out to me direct or to Cadell direct and talk to us for a bit to even be a part of those because they're not just open to the public. But the, most of the events are just open to the wider uh, public, including the one that will be at Katowice and the one that will be in Krakow. Those are Polish uh, cities. And we had uh, representatives of both of those places who are bringing us there uh, on as the second guests on today's all day live stream. Okay. So with that said, May is when the European tour is going down. I think we have a spot in Evora, Portugal for a sort of conference before the conference. And there's a lot of really cool stuff going into that, but it's also kind of up in the air because there's complications now. Um, so stay tuned for kind of locking down the dates. We know for sure that we will be collaborating with Ashley Frowley in Greece. We know for sure about the London stuff, the Brussels stuff, the Paris stuff, the Polish stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm not too desperate. If people don't roll the red uh, carpet out for me and make it really easy. I don't care, uh, because I only want to work with people who are eager and, uh, pe not too eager. I don't, I don't want to work with people who are too eager, but I do want to work with people who are welcoming and making it easy as opposed to people who want it. They wish for it, but also things are too complicated. Hey, maybe next time. Okay. Well, what's coming out of the tour? What's the fucking point of a tour? Part of the point of a tour is to break outside of this medium and into people's IRL spaces, but to incorporate those IRL spaces into the actual institution of Theory Underground, which is that we were experimenting with the hybrid model all tour. We did events uh, all across the US, coast to coast. We did stuff with Mikey in Kansas City at this epic bookstore, Prospero's bookstore. Uh, but we also did stuff in Washington, DC at that famous pizza shop, the Comet Ping Pong. We did uh, stuff in, uh, a, a super bougie art school in Chicago. Uh, we did stuff at the McLuhan Institute in Ontario. We did stuff uh, at the bougiest uh, college you could ever go to called Pomona. It has like a $3 billion uh, endowment um, thanks to the some amazing faculty there. Uh, and so, you know, it's inside the university, it's outside the university. We're happy to use university resources if people can get those for us, if we can hack the system, of course, because otherwise we're just doing it on our own money, right? It's all very expensive to have to do this kind of thing. And so, you know, uh, but we think it's important. And the conversations that we're having, the presentations that we're doing, the papers that are being written are all ultimately going towards, what? how many was it, Nance? We were talking about the different volumes. At this point, there are... Uh, eight different calls for proposals in development for eight different anthologies, all of which will be small little anthologies as opposed to this fat boy right here. Um, and that would be one on critical media theory, one on professionals and managers of capital, PMC, one on Zizek and the Ljubljana School, one on underground theory from scene to milieu, one on underground theory, a discourse in search of a method, one on value for Marxism versus the labor theory of value and one on critical doxology and time energy, though that might break into two, one would be, which would be focused on kind of this imminent but uh, sort of dignifying uh, critique of the doxa of our day, which is mostly uh, self-help and business uh, success kinds of books and gurus. Uh, as a, And then the other one being the time energy book, uh, notes towards time energy. Mikey, uh, and several other people have done their own writing on the on the idea. And so it would be a collection of different people's ideas on time energy because the idea at this point is already bigger than me. And the final one would be the Human Futures volume. All the Nick Land stuff is absolutely essential for the Human Futures volume. And so I hope that you each in your closing statements might say something about any one of those volumes that you are especially excited about. Uh, and then, of course, the final presentations for a lot of the stuff that's going into those volumes will be in Boise, Idaho, of all places, in the, during the last month or uh, week of October 2024. Cool. Um, so that's pretty much the things. Uh, I started a Patreon and a Substack recently. So somebody in the comments section said that I'm a self-entitled shill. And I did want you guys to kind of, I know you guys don't think I should dignify it. You guys don't think I should take it seriously. 
but it is like a thought that comes to people's minds, especially people who've never had to do anything or leave their house, uh, especially people who are on their parents' allowances, who don't actually produce things and who've never really, uh, I don't know, experienced the difference between a cost and, uh, and, uh, and a price. Like, cause the, the price that I put on things never actually exceeds the actual cost of what I put into those things. And, you know, that's bad business, but here I am. So with that all said, everybody, anthologies you're excited about and say something about me as a shill. All right. Thanks. I think, uh, I'm, I think I'm most excited about the human, human futures, uh, volume. I'm also really excited about the, the volume on value. Um, we've been going through doing a very careful reading of Mark's, uh, the last couple of months and it will continue. Uh, and I'm just really excited about it. And again, they're all interconnected. They all relate to one another, but they, they will be, um, I don't know, volumes, uh, in themselves. Uh, but it's all really exciting. Um, and as far as the, the shilling thing goes, uh, we really need to put out something on, on money realism, like something substantial because it does boil down to the fact that when you are living in real life, in the real world, and, and you're engaged in something real, real projects, whatever it is, um, you like come into a relationship with money where you're just like, yeah, this is something that has to be spent on things like food and shelter, um, and base psychological needs and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it's fun to live in, in the ideal world where we're all radical leftists and you're, you're just a shill cause you're asking for money and blah, blah, blah. Um, but also keep that shit to yourself, dude. That really just demonstrates your lack of maturity at the end of the day um and we don't need to be wasting time doing little bullshit internet putt putt games like we really are trying to do serious shit um everyone here everyone that's involved here all the guests all the people that have written all the people that have done work in the background that never gets noticed um so keep that shit to yourself dude Well said, Nance. I mean, I'll just say very quickly, the human future sounds great. I'd love to participate in that. I'm also excited about the logic for the Global Brain Anthology that we're going to publish at Philosophy Portal. Dave, you'll have an article in it. Um, and that sort of brings together like sort of, you know, my interest in Hegel and, you know, my PhD thesis on the global brain in an interesting way. So for me, that's sort of a special release. Um, and then I guess on the human on the on the dave as a shill thing i mean it's just so beyond absurd but i i do sort of think that leftist politics needs to go sex negative precisely so that they can start to see civilizational construction as positive um and uh yeah i think that's just a fundamental problem with leftist politics so yeah. what does that mean yeah what does that mean to say uh this thing about well i i I actually take this, this is the point I take from Alenka's article in, in the Underground Theory Anthology, which is that first, there she calls it sexo-leftism. And sexo-leftism has basically the first approach in the 1960s to be um, against the regulation of sex. Uh, and now there's a form of leftism which sort of sees um, a new a new type of regulation of sex in gender identity as a positive meaning. And both of those things for Alenka are sort of obfuscations of the fact that sex is fundamentally a disorienting negativity. And consequently, I just I just think that if if we think leftist politics from this point of view, we have a different perspective on civilizational construction. I'm not sure if that that totally makes sense. Right, and I can see some confusion in the Twitch uh, chat, but Adam, I'd just say that uh, it, sex is being used in a very interesting way here. So you just have to watch the uh, the first conversation from the day that when I had with Alenka to really get into what she means by that, because it's a very specific thing. It, it's not the 
well, arguably it is what builds the civilization, but it also it's, we're not talking about being uh, anti-sex or something like that. That's not what that means. But uh, we're very obviously pro, pro-sex pro here. This is, that's why I made this meme, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Mikey, you kind of get the closing, you know, thought here. And then I got to run to this movie. Yeah, I'm excited about the Human Futures volume. Uh, I know that all three of you in particular could write something really cool. Samuel Longcar can write something. I hope you can get Justin Murphy to give you something. I think he would have something really cool to add to that volume. Um, The value form thing is, that seems overly intellectual probably to a lot of people, but I think it's of fundamental importance. So that one's great. Um, You know, I'm all... I'm excited for the libidinal economy, Zizek, we'd be honest, school thing. So lots of cool ones to uh, be thinking about. Um, people want to, you know, get their ideas spinning, you know, for uh, for papers or s- submissions. Um, as far as the shill thing goes, I mean, how dare you want to fight for a meaningful life? How dare you want to have access to food? How dare you want clothes and shelter? Fuck you. Head to the bridge, bud. That's what I'm going to go do, actually. You know, I was going to go see this movie with Anne, but I think actually... I mean, I'm that's gr- really the message, right? It's just, the message is like, head to the bridge. Like, yeah, fuck you, dude. Thinking is super uncool, and that's why you should do it. It's just like... You muted, you anything muted. anything that's like... Sorry, I, I started rolling the PSA by accident. I clicked the wrong button. Uh, okay, sorry. What were you saying? Go to the bridge. No, I'm, okay. I'm just, you know, fucking around. The point is, now fuck that motherfucker. Yeah. So, yeah. so what? Because, what, you like theory? You're supposed to not want to be able to make a living doing what you like? I thought that's, isn't that the whole idea, at least the, the, the abstract idea behind capitalism is that you can figure out a way to do something you want to do and make a living. And now we know about the realities of it, but um, I don't know where somebody can be coming from. To yeah. That's no, why man, I say it, don't fucking worry about it because it's so stupid that no, ev- necessitate ev- a response. Everything should be free. Oh, okay. So that means that we who are already, who have already traded more than our 20,000 hours due to society, to, you know, the, the, the system to make it run, we actually just need to, to keep working for the rest of our lives and just do this on the side. That this is, you always go back to, it's impossible that we get free from wage labor. If we ever actually get free from wage labor without the PhD, then we've done something that was supposed to be impossible. Now, of course, I got sixty thousand dollars of debt and a master's degree. Uh, unlike you, but if we but do, point, it, we still do the act. Capital A. We perform. We make the, the impossible possible. Right, and that's what it really boils down to. They don't want but to see us escape. Us dead. That's the point. You have well, not the majority of people would root for us, but you will have a couple people who would rather us die than be able to get free from wage labor. Whatever. Um, okay. I mean, but I mean. The, the comment's so dumb. I mean, uh, just just say what you want, which is, if, you know, I don't like you, head to the bridge. That's the real meaning. So if that's the case, and I, whatever, keep it moving. Okay. Maybe later. Um, uh, and uh, to the person in the chat asking if the calls uh, for papers have been made public yet, um, honestly, I've got too many submissions already for some of these. I kind of have to figure out which ones will be made public. The best way to do this is to reach out to me direct. I'm not a university. I don't have to do this any sort of, oh, it's open to everybody kind of way. But it's for fellow travelers. It's specifically for people who are taking courses at Theory Underground. Um, If you're doing all the Capital Monday stuff with me and Nance, then I'd want to get you in on the value form stuff as long as you can write a banger ass paper that really contributes something. Um, if you've done the critical media theory cohorts one and are getting geared up to do uh, the second one, we got at least a couple of people binging the past one. Then, uh, yeah, then yeah, we would definitely take a. Uh, we're, we're we're open to people who are part of the cohort. 
um, putting forward pieces. Um, but we're not just taking pieces from from people who are interested. Oh, here's my opinion. I'm really smart. Here's my opinion. We do get a lot of offers like that. I know there's a lot of really great people working in isolation. They're very alienated. But the point of going from a scene to a milieu is to say, no, get a basis in the course. There's a reason I use courses instead of just YouTube videos or Twitch streams. Um, and that's because we have to get a shared grounding. We have to figure out what we're talking about. Um, and so a lot of these courses, especially the professionals and managers of capital one, the professional managerial critique, there's a whole course on that. It's free. It's on the, oh shit, you fucked up my everything. Oh my God. Okay. Who just left? Tell, you gotta warn me before you do this shit. Hold on. Um, Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm about to close out. It's just that I have like a, a OBS set up here. But OK, all I'm saying is that uh, get involved with the courses or reach out to me direct. Ask which course for the specific anthology you want to be in. We can work from there. Um, uh, obviously, there's there's exceptions to the general rule, but that's what the general rule is. All right, everybody, I've got to roll out of here. Really, thank you so much, everybody. Cadell, especially you. I know it's like the middle of the night for you. So everybody, have a wonderful rest of your day. This has been a wonderful, what, how many hours is it? 11 hours and 53 minutes, which means it'll probably get cut off before the end anyway. So everyone, uh, take care. Peace. Much love. Take care. Bye-bye. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research, and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts, and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McKerricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing. But first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until 
we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money. And with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon <laughs> and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. My way of giving back to everybody is by promoting everyone who is at a current tier to the benefits of the tier above them, as far as subscribers go, and also rolling out a new lower tier. And so check out the tier subscription setup and if you're not interested in taking the courses or what's being offered for subscribers and you want to support anyway, check out the Patreon. Finally, just stay tuned for more information on the tour in Europe during the month of May 2024 and the conference in Mexico during the last weekend of October 2024. If you want to be there, hit me up ASAP. Let's get talking because it's happening very soon. All right. Bye-bye. Special shout out to Nikolai, Sahil, and Zot Sandra, as well as all of my other amazing patrons over at patreon.com.